good to be here. Had a wonderful day today. Been, been studying all day and got up and went up to take a shower a little bit early. My wife had to hear me sing in the shower for about, mm -hmm. about 25 minutes, bless her heart. I can't sing a lick, Bill, but you ain't going to take my song from me. Amen. Amen. I, I, I mean, you get to thinking sometimes, man, and, and there's verses in the Bible that we just, we know they're there, but we just the depths of them. In whom we have redemption. Yeah, yeah. I was a, I was an old worthless, good for nothing. God God said we were unprofitable. Yeah. But yet He loved us enough to purchase us with His own blood. Amen. What a thing! Yeah. Bought by the blood of Christ. Amen. Goodness gracious. Amen. Ephesians four. I wasn't worth that. No. Amen. Yeah. People say all the time, "Why did God do it? He did it for His great love." Yeah. Amen. For his great love wherewith he loved us. Ephesians chapter 4. Probably just going to look at this verse tonight, verse 1. Next week we'll, we'll, we're going to cover verses 2 through 6 mm -hmm. all together. Next, next week we're going to look at seven baptisms. The seven baptisms. <laughs> Paul, Paul said one of the things that unifies us is back one baptism. Yeah. Ever think yeah. about that? Amen. Yeah. And yet the doctrine of baptism is probably the most divisive doctrine in Christianity. You're right. Whose name do you baptize in? Is it sprinkling or immersion? Is it necessary for salvation or just fellowship and membership? I mean, you just started nine churches right there and Paul said there's one baptism that unifies us in the body of Christ. Right. Yeah. That's why Paul, listen, the only time Paul mentioned water baptism in, in his epistles, the only time Paul mentioned water baptism, he mentioned it in context of the vision and said, Christ didn't send me to do it. Right. Yep. Right. Amen? Right. And so people make a much ado about nothing. Sure. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says right here, he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now for a minute here, before we really look at this verse, I want you to notice how Paul refers to himself as the prisoner of the Lord. And this is more important than what most people see. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse number 17, he, back in verse 16, he said, God has not given us the spirit of adoption again to fear, but the spirit of adoption, or the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He said, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God. And so because I'm a child of God, Bill, I, I'm an heir of God Almighty. Sure. You say, how do you become a child? Paul said in Galatians 3.16, you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Yeah. By simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I've become an adopted child of God, Amen. and I'm now an heir of God. Amen. Every person that's been saved is an heir of God. Yes. Amen. Because we are adopted, we were predestinated to adoption, Ephesians 1.4. And because God had already predestinated us to the adoption of children, He also predestinated us to an inheritance. Ephesians 1.11. But Paul goes on to say in Romans 8.17, And join heirs with Christ. Yeah. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Mm -hmm. Not every Christian is going to be glorified together with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Paul just said that. He, 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 what Paul's saying here, listen, not only this is what Paul referred to as the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, to become a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. But in order to become an, a joint heir with Jesus Christ, we have to suffer with Him, and the sufferings that Paul is talking about are very specific. In Philippians 3.10, he calls it the fellowship of His sufferings. Right. It's the sufferings of Christ. And in order to know the sufferings of Christ, Paul had to suffer the loss of everything that was gained to him. Mm -hmm. Do you realize had Paul just simply preached circumcision, most of his suffering would have stopped. Sure. Yeah. He could have got up and said, Jesus died for your sins, was buried, rose again from the dead, and if you believe on him, you're saved, but after salvation, you need to be circumcised. His persecution would have ceased. Right. What caused Paul's sufferings, anybody can go out here and beat a brick over their head, any nut can 
go and nail himself to a cross and claim to be suffering for Christ. What Paul suffered for was for the pure doctrine of the Word of God. Yeah. 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 He suffered for what Christ revealed to him. And in 1 Timothy 1.16, Paul tells us that he is the pattern. He's our pattern. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.16, he said, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first. What does first mean? First one. Yeah. Then your pattern ain't Peter. Right. True. And it ain't James and it ain't John. He said that he might in me first, he might show forth a pattern of all long suffering to them who should hereafter, after Paul, believe on him to life everlasting. Yes. Paul was the pattern of the believer. That's why he tells the Corinthians over there, oh, we're, we're Peter and I'm of Apollos. And Paul said, was, is, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? And people say, you see, you dispensationalists, you ain't supposed to be following Paul. Well, what did Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 4? Though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For I through the gospel have begotten you to Jesus Christ. Wherefore, be ye followers of me. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. Now, I'm going to tell you, as a saved person, there are 10,000 instructors in Christ around this world. Mm -hmm. But you are told to follow certain type of men. Yeah. Not everybody gets up behind a pulpit is, 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 is somebody you ought to follow. I didn't say they were lost. Well, when Paul says you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, he didn't say those 10,000 men were lost. He said they weren't worth your time to follow. He said they're full, they're reigning as kings. He said, look at me. He said, I'm a fool, they're wise. I'm poor, they're rich. Yeah. That's what he said. What Paul's saying here is he's saying, be followers together of me. And then in Philippians, he says this. Not only him, but he says over there. He says, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction. I didn't say these men were lost. When you read a verse like that, whose end is destruction, you know what, you know what Paul's talking about there? The destruction, their, their destruction is going to come at the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. What are they going to have destroyed? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.17, Know you not that you are the temple of God and the Holy Ghost which is in you? Did he, did he say that? Mm -hmm. Who's the temple of God? Christians or lost people? <laughs> well, you know what Paul said next? Whosoever defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Yeah. Yep. That's at the judgment seat, folks. We're talking about things that have eternal ramifications. We can either be a vessel of honor throughout eternity or a vessel of dishonor. Well, we're talking about our life to come and what the life that we, 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 we have an eternity to live after this. What's the collar of the church carpet going to matter in 15 million years? There are people that leave churches over what side of the church the piano's on. What's that going to matter in 25 million years? You see, God has called us to become joint heirs with His Son. This is the high calling of God in Christ. And, and we, will either, we will either be accepted of Him or be denied that. And what Paul, what Paul as, as the pattern of our long suffering, what Paul suffered for was for the mystery that Christ revealed, him, revealed to him. Let me read you some verses here. Then we'll really start looking at Ephesians. But I, that's important to understand this, this prison, this suffering of Paul. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says this, that he said, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which is given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, who did he appear to? Paul. Now at the end of this letter, Paul says that there's a crown of righteousness given to all them that love His appearing. And we're not just talking about the rapture. Christ, Christ appeared. He died, was buried, risen again. He ascended back to heaven. He appeared to Paul. Multiple times He appeared to Paul and revealed things to him. 
And it was through this appearing of Christ that he made these things manifest. And Paul says, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. What did he suffer for? The things that Christ had appeared or revealed to him. It'll get you in trouble. It'll get you in trouble with Baptists. It'll get you in trouble with Methodists. It'll get you in trouble with Catholics, Presbyterians, Episcopalians. Yeah. It'll get you in trouble with the world. Yeah. The more, the, the closer we get to God, the more we're going to suffer in this world. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says this. He tells Timothy, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. I guarantee you, I guarantee you I've had more people reject me than has accepted me. That's a guarantee. I've had women get up and storm out of church because I preached on the authority of, of the male, on male headship. I've had multiple women get up and storm out of church on me. I had two, I had two 16 year old girls get up and storm out of church one night because I was telling them Britney Spears should ain't somebody they should look up to. Right. <laughs> I told them, I said, you find a man that loves the Lord Jesus Christ and get married to him and be loyal to that man and you'll find happiness. And I don't have to hear this junk walked out of church. Mm -hmm. I've had people cuss me. Amen. Yeah, no. He ain't yet. It's probably come close to him. Right? <laughs> but he suffered trouble as an evildoer. There was nothing evil about him. But they had him in bonds and in chains as a common criminal. For doing what? Preaching that Christ died for their sins. And that they could not save themselves. Their own righteousness wasn't good enough. They had to be reconciled to God through Christ. And even after reconciliation, they had to walk in Christ by faith and let Him fill them with His righteousness. Circumcision don't make you righteous. Baptism don't make you righteous. The Eucharist don't make you righteous. Holy water don't make you righteous. Sleeping with a Bible under your pillow don't make you righteous. Not setting a cup of coffee on your Bible don't make you righteous. What makes you righteous is being unified in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Nothing more. <clears throat> it's got Paul in trouble. Had a woman tell me one time, she said, I don't say anything on my Bible. I was like, you don't read it either by the looks of it. It's crisp as a $20 bill, brand new $20 bill. <laughs> hey man, superstition. Yeah. I perceive that in all things you are far too superstitious. And what Paul says here, he says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. Now how are we denied? You don't go to hell, but you're denied the right to reign with Him. He denies you. He's, you, he's not, you're not accepted of Him. Then Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, he says, Therefore we labor that whether absent or present, we may be accepted of Him. And so, and so there's going to be a multitude of Christians that are not accepted before the Lord. Christ is going to meet us in the air and then He's going to take us and present us to the Father. It's 1 Thessalonians 3.13. And, 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 what, and what, this is what Paul goes on to say, study to show thyself approved unto who? Not man. Unto God. A what? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. A man that studies and understands the mind of God and the will of God and God's eternal purpose, they're not going to be ashamed before God at the judgment seat. Why? Because Paul said, Be ye not, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What? That ye may prove what is that perfect, good, and acceptable will of God. It's a mind that understands and knows the will of God. We have the mind of Christ. Yeah. That's what approves us to God. Amen? Let me read you one more verse, then we'll come back to Ephesians. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I love this. I love this chapter right here. 
If you're going to suffer, you, you need to suffer for the mission. That's what I'm talking about. You say, how do you deny the Lord? Paul said they profess that they know God, but in works deny Him. We're not, listen, we're not, we're not talking about because somebody goes out here and drinks, they, they deny Him by the works. Most of the way churches operate today and most of the things men preach behind the pulpit, they profess that they know God, but in works deny Him. They don't have a clue what they're talking about. They know nothing about God. They know nothing about what God's plan to do. They don't know. They get up and they preach something for you and your kids and you and your family and for you. You see, to walk, if you're going to walk worthy of the Lord, everything has to center around Christ. Religion centers around you. Listen, mm -hmm. chew it up. Let's sit in the belly. God give you understanding in all things. What I just said is very profound. It's the truth. Yeah. If we're going to walk worthy of the Lord, we have to center everything around the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion is centered around you. Right. And that's why people love religion. Right. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. oh, we go down there because they have a powerful music ministry. Meaning, I like to dance and feel good. Yeah. That's all that means. That's right. Yeah. That's all it means. That's good. If it was centered around Christ, you would be somewhere where you can increase in the knowledge of God. That's right. Amen. And so Paul says here in 2 Timothy 4 1, he says, I charge thee therefore. Now what Paul's talking about in chapter 3, he said there's going to come a time, man, when, when the whole world's going to go crazy. They're, just going, they're going to be reprobate concerning the faith. Evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. He says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And then in chapter 4 he says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. I love that. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth that shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, Endure inflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul's like a 757 about ready to take flight, man. <laughs> the time of my departure is at hand. This is what he says. I have fought a good fight. That's what I want. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's baptized, Paul. Paul said he didn't care how many he baptized. Right. He said Christ didn't send me to do it. <laughs> That's yeah. so what he said. Mm -hmm. I made you run. Paul said, I fought a good fight. Mm -hmm. He writes this at the end of a letter in which he had just stated that everybody in Asia had turned from him. Now he's in prison and he said, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me what? Salvation? No, mm -hmm. the crown of righteousness. Right. Paul received the prize. They that run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. Yeah. Paul's not talking about salvation here. He's saying, he's saying I, I've achieved, I, I finished my course, I kept the faith, I fought a good fight, and because I did, Christ is going to reward me with a joint heirship in His kingdom. I'm not going to be denied in the presence of God. Yeah. That's a big deal to me, Gary. Yeah. I don't want to be the, the one man that loved me enough and kept me from hell. The only man that, that I should value his opinion. The only man that I should truly value his opinion. I do not want to stand before him and not be approved of him. Yeah. Amen. So what does it take? It takes, it takes learning the truth and then preaching it and being willing to suffer for it. When we talk about suffering for Christ, it's a suffering that comes naturally upon knowing Him. And as you get in the mind of Christ, the more the fellowship of His sufferings you're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to partake in. And so when Paul says he's a prisoner of the Lord, that's important stuff because that's our pattern. Our apostle. Amen? Mm -hmm. Alright, now he says in Ephesians 4.1, he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Now here Paul pleads with us. He said, I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So he's pleading with us to walk worthy. And here's how people read the Bible. 
Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. That means don't sin. That's how people are. That's how people read the Bible. They think walking worthy just means quit cussing and quit drinking. But I'll tell you right now, man, I've been in churches with some 70-year-old women that hadn't missed church in 40 years that was more danger to your church than some drunk. Right. Yeah. I've, listen, man, I'm not new at this. I'm, I'm, you know, I had, I had a... <coughs> God bless her heart. I pastored a church one time. My biggest threat in that church was a woman who never missed church but she never read her Bible either. She wouldn't stay off the phone doing this. You think that's walking worthy? She didn't drink. She didn't cuss. You think that's walking worthy? Tearing down and, and, and breaking apart the very thing Christ died to create, a new man in Christ? People don't think about this stuff. What Paul's saying here is that we, we are to walk worthy of this calling. You don't get to define what it is. Paul, Paul laid out what our calling was in chapters 1 through 3. And what he's telling us here is to walk worthy of what he, the purpose for which God saved us that Paul, that was revealed to Paul and he made known in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And it's only by coming to a spiritual, true spiritual understanding of this great mystery Reveal to Paul that we can walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Amen? Mm -hmm. If God raised His Son from the dead, <clears throat> set Him at His own right hand to fill all things, is that the reason He did it? Ephesians 1, 23. Gave Him to be the head over the, all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. So Christ died, right? He died on the cross. He went back to the heaven. He went back to the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places, for what purpose? God made him the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So what is Christ's purpose in heaven right now? It's to fill everything. This is what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3. His, his goal for us, Ephesians 3, 20, 19, is that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 4, 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Then your job is, is more than being rehabilitated and being a better you. Yeah. My job, my, my purpose as a Christian now that I'm saying the way that I walk worthy of this position and this calling of God is to let Christ fill me. And make no mistake about it, look over to Ephesians 5. It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. Look at Ephesians 5, 17. 5, 16. I, I've, I've, listen, I was raised in southern West Virginia. I don't know how much church you attended y'all done in southern West Virginia. There's some superstitious voodoo mumbo jumbo that goes on in southern West Virginia. And I've been in services, man, where people will come to an altar and beg and snot for three and a half hours. You say, what's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with that, but if you ain't reading your Bible for more than five minutes a week, it's a waste of your time. Sure. Yeah. This is already done. Yeah. Yeah. You ain't got to ask God to do it. His son already died to put your old man to death. He's already risen from the dead so that you can walk in newness of life. God has already set his son in heaven, joined you to him, made him the head of a new man so that he can feel everything. Paul says here in Ephesians 5, book of verse 16, read verse 15, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. <clears throat> Who did he tell to be filled with the Spirit? You. He didn't tell you to come beg. Did he say, come beg, John? <laughs> did, he say, did he say, ask? He said, be filled. That's my responsibility. That's your responsibility. And I've heard people say all the time, oh God, just fill me with your spirit. And then they've got so much stuff in their life that's, that's obstructing God 
from feeling them that it's impossible for God to feel them. It's my job. It's my duty. It's your duty as Christians to be filled. And if we're not being filled, the problem's not with God. The problem's with others. I've always said that. It can be bad doctrine. There are people right now that are just as saved as I'm saved, just the same as you're saved, sitting in churches getting bad doctrine that are not being filled with the fullness of God. <coughs> Amen? It could be bad doctrine. It could be tradition. I, one, one of the things God, uh, one of the things that hindered me the most in my Christian life was tradition. Things that I just heard and took for granted that God had to unlearn me of. Yeah. And this is why when we talk about repentance, when you hear the word repentance, people just think, well, repentance means, you know, being real sorry for sin and not doing it no more. Repentance is a change of mind. That's right. And when you're, if you, one of the first things you've got to do when you get serious about God is say, God, you can change my mind on anything. Right. Yeah, that's right. Amen. And until we get to that point where God can change our mind on anything, I don't care how long it's been a well-established uh, tradition of the faith and the historic Baptist doctrine. If it ain't biblical, brother, I'm dropping it like a bad habit. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Because once I started letting God unlearn me of the garbage, and then He can start teaching me the truth, man, the life of Christ took root in me and I started getting filled, John. Amen. That's right. And I'm, I'm, I don't want to hinder God. He wants to do this. You know, a verse I quote all the time is where Paul told him in Corinthians. He said, you're straightened in your own bowels. <clears throat> God's up here. He's already blessed you with everything. Is that, is that what he said in Ephesians 1, 3? <coughs> God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Did he say that? Yep. Did, what, what did Paul say? He said, our mouth is open, our heart is enlarged. So Paul and them was open. Paul, Paul, there, Paul wasn't holding anything back. Then you know what he said? He said, you're not straightening us, you're straightening your own bowels. He said, be you also enlarged. I told my brother that today on the phone. He, he, he said, what hinders us? I said, your own bowels, that's what hinders you. Your own heart, your own mind. You've got to open up and God will feel it. Amen? Yeah, right. Tradition, pride. Sometimes pride gets in the way of people. Well, if I believe that, I'd have to admit I've been wrong for 20 years. Who cares? What, you want to be wrong for the next 20? Yeah. Because you got too much pride to admit you were wrong the first 20? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> God's a, God is true. I'm a liar. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. God can change my mind today. Shut up, y'all. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize you said amen to that. But it, it, no, amen. It, 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 it needs an amen. But uh, amusement, bad doctrine, all these things, man. But 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 let me let me go over this real quick. I want to show you just a couple things. I'll be done. Five ten minutes. Uh, when we're walking worthy of the Lord, it's evident. There's four marks that evident. There's four marks of 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 evidence in somebody that's walking worthy of the Lord. Number one, he's, he's fruitful in every good work. <coughs> you say, what's that mean? Well, what's a good work? It has to be work that falls in line with the will of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. Christians, got, Christians got this idea of good work that it's, you know, it's feeding the homeless or it's going out here and helping the poor. And those, those things are good, but Hollywood does the same thing. Angelina and, Jolie and Brad, Angelina and Jolie and Brad Pitt do these things. It's, it's, it's nothing at the end of the day, and it's going to mean nothing in eternity. He that soweth to the flesh shall love the flesh what? Reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall love the Spirit reap life everlasting. Paul said, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. What, what is wrought in us and produced in us by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit is eternal. It lasts forever. What I sow and give to the flesh might last five years, might last ten years, but I promise you it ain't going to last forever. Yeah. It never will. I know what's going to happen to my kids, my vehicles. I know what's going to happen to my money. It don't matter to me. Amen? And so what Paul's, 
Paul's talking about here being fruitful in every good work. He's talking about he's talking about the work as as we uh, uh, do good works in alignment with the will of God, the will of God that's been been revealed to us. It starts to, to produce fruit in the life of the believer. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, he said, I planted Apollo's water. God gave the increase. Amen? Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And so he's talking about bringing forth fruit. Look at Romans chapter 7. <coughs> Great chapter here. I swear, man, time just flies. Romans chapter 7. You're dead to two things in, in the book of Romans. You're dead to sin and you're dead to the law. You will never bring forth fruit by either one of them. You put yourself in a fleshly religion. These people get up every Sunday, uh, you know, like Paul White and Benny Hinn and these clowns, and get up and talk about, oh, I don't have any more sin in my flesh, and then they catch them laid up in a hotel fornicating together. <laughs> yep, yep. Hey, man, go out on YouTube. I hope, I hope the whole world sees it. This, who, this who's advising Trump in the White House. Yeah. Amen? Listen, Paul says right here in Romans 7, 1, he says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her law. Husband. She ain't bound to the law, she's bound to her husband. So long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her law. Husband. So the law binds her to the law of her husband. Right? Yeah. That's what he says. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law. Listen, that being dead wherein we were held. That's talking about our flesh. That first husband is dead. My first husband is the flesh. And as long as I was under the law, the law bound me to the law of my flesh, which is sin. That's good. Yeah, that's right. But the moment I believed on Christ, the old man was crucified, that being dead, this thing, wherein I was held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So this, you say, what's this got to do with anything? This is the kind of doctrine that brings forth fruit in the life of the believer. Somebody getting up going, you don't, you, if you've got a TV, you ain't right with God. You, listen, man, you can wear a denim skirt 10 feet past your ankles and have your hair in 83 buns and never put a drop of makeup on. It doesn't mean anything. It's fleshly show. That's all it is. Yeah, right. Yeah. Fruit is produced by the Holy Spirit in the believer through hearing and believing good doctrine. Yeah. Amen. That's where it comes from. Philippians chapter 1. I'm not going to get through this chapter again. Tonight. Look at Philippians chapter 1. I love this verse right here. Because those, I mean, we, all right, Paul's talking about being filled with the knowledge of his will. We, we have a mind that understands and comprehends the will of God. But listen to what he says in Philippians 1 9. We're talking about bringing forth fruit. My job is to be filled, my goal is to be filled with the life of Christ. It's evident by fruit. My goal is not only to be filled myself, but to fill each and every one of you. And for you to fill each other. And, and all of us to bring forth fruit in our life. But he says in Philippians 1 9, and this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. It's not just coming together and oh, I love you, and let's kiss and hug and sing kumbaya. He said, he said that your love may abound in all knowledge and in all judgment. And so what, what we need is, is when God reveals his knowledge and his will to us, 
What perfects it, Paul says, in uh, Colossians, he, he, says, he says, above all, take like, charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And so as, as I have all this knowledge and understanding and all these things that God gives me, love is the thing that brings it all together and guides it. And guides it correctly. Verse 10, he says, that ye may approve the things that are excellent. That ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Listen, I, 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 can't, I can't do anybody any good if I don't, if I don't have any love in my heart. Paul, Paul said, hey man, though I have understanding in all mysteries, though I have faith that can move mountains, if I don't have charity, I am nothing. And so as, as God reveals these things to us, we, we are to let love abound in these things. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Last point, back in Colossians. Let me read you this one thing here and I'll be done. Colossians chapter 1. So I might just write these other two down. Y'all don't believe me or not? Nah, I'm going to teach y'all next week. I've got to teach y'all. Because there's some good stuff. It was there. close. <laughs> Increasing in the knowledge of God. This is another evidence. Hey, John. Being fruitful in every good work, increasing. I get off. I see the increasing in the knowledge of God. And so, not only, not only are we fruitful in every good work as we walk worthy, but we increase in the knowledge of God. Now, folks, listen. Increasing in the knowledge of God. Isn't that our glory? Isn't that what Jeremiah said? If a man's going to glory, let him glory in this that he knoweth me. Isn't this what Paul told the, the Athenians to repent of? Ignorance of God? I can walk into churches today running 1,500 and stand up and preach exactly what Paul preached in Acts chapter 17 and never miss a lick. They've got NIVs and NASVs and all these new Bibles and there's a new Bible coming out every day. And what did Paul tell me? What did the Bible say about the Athenians? They spent all their day either to hear or to tell some new thing. And then they had this altar to the unknown God and Paul said, whom you ignorantly worship him declare I unto you. You think Joel Osteen's, you think the, the, the 15,000 that sit and listen to that man every Sunday in Texas knows anything about the day of redemption, the day of the Lord, the tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel, the judgment seat of Christ? Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, the mystery of Israel's blindness, Christ in you, the hope of glory. They don't know nothing except the power of I am and your best life now. But boy, it sells, don't it? And I'm not going to apologize for taking the sword of the Lord and cutting this stuff down and putting it where it belongs. In the dead pot. <laughs> we were told to repent of our ignorance of God. It's this knowledge that Paul suffered the loss of all things for. He said that I may know Him. If you don't know Him tonight, it's because there's things in your life that you refuse to let go of. Amen? Right. Is it, this is why God gave us His Spirit. So that we can know the things that are freely given to us of God. Let me let you in on a little secret. If you're sitting in a church where your mind is being blinded to who God is, Satan's in the background of that church. It is Him that blinds the minds, <clears throat> lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ should shine. And only you and you only know if you truly know God or not. And I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about Christians increasing in knowing the one who saved them. Right. Right. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about increasing in the knowledge of God. And I'm not even talking about perfect knowledge. Now we see darkly through a glass, Bill. I only see him vaguely. Yeah. But I'll tell you this, if you're walking worthy of him, you know more about him today than you did yesterday. Sure. And if you're walking worthy, you're going to know more tomorrow than you did today.
today. And if you've been playing religion for 20 years, you're just as dumb as you were 20 years ago. Amen. That's right. <coughs> and that's the truth of it, man. Absolutely, positively. Why? Because as I said earlier, we're going up, I promise. <coughs> as I said earlier, when you're walking worthy of the Lord, it puts Christ at the center. And when you're playing religion, it puts you at the center. Right. There you go. Yeah. Amen. And that's the truth of it. We'll, we'll, we'll look at the last two evidences next Wednesday night because they're good. Where Paul said, strengthen with all might. Unto patience, unto patience and long suffering with joyful. That's when Paul says that, being strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. That's why he said in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. People say, oh, I can climb Mount Everest. I can move mountains through Christ. Can you suffer? Can you be locked in prison? Yeah. Can you go hungry? That's what Paul's talking about. The more we know him, Gary, the, the more strength we get in our inner man and the more hope we have. The, the, when, when, when the Spirit of God's working in us, He's educating us on the eternal purpose of God. The temporary things no longer matter. Right. Right. Amen? Yes. Giving thanks unto the Father. Giving thanks, man. The more I know Him, the more I want to sing about Him. I was listening to some songs. I was telling Bill before I come to church, I was over listening to uh, my dad's camp meeting from 2016. We had a guy sing... Uh, uh, Named Rick Lilly. He sung two of my favorite songs in that camp meeting, man. There was preachers there. Boy, they cut loose shouting. And I was sitting there watching that, man. The tears just rolling down my face, yeah. man. Yeah, he sung that song that I mentioned that I love him. How I worship and adore him. And I mentioned he's been faithful to every promise he ever made. Yeah. For God, man. I give thanks to him. I'm thankful for him. Amen. I'm thankful for everything that he's done. Amen. There's not enough words. No. There's not enough paper. Mm -hmm. I like that old song that said, Could we with ink the oceans fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill? And every man a scribe by trade? Amen? Mm -hmm. To write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole go stretched from sky to sky. Amen. <laughs> And you know what? i got the rest of eternity to learn about. It. Yeah, amen. Amen. I'm thankful for who He is. I give thanks unto the Father because He's made me meet. He's made me acceptable yeah. to Him. Amen. 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 And He's making me more acceptable each and every day. Uh, thank you for your time. I hope, uh, I hope we get through this sometime. <laughs> we'll, try to, we'll try to get through those next two uh, uh, Wednesday night. And we'll just see how it goes. But uh, let's pray. Our Father.